My name is Tim Cole. I'm the Clinical Affairs Manager for the Heidelberg Engineering Academy in the UK um, and I'm joined this evening by Mark Holloway. Mark is a, an optometrist from over in Dronfield where he, he runs a practice called Thomas and Holloway uh, Optometrist. So Mark's uh, going to be joining me and co-presenting this session with me this evening. Um, uh, the wonderful Emily Melbourne is, is in the background uh, helping us from a technical point of view and uh, making sure everything's working with this uh, GoToWebinar um, uh, thing that we use for doing these sessions. Um, so Emily's also going to appear right at the end uh, when we do some, some Q&A. So I think for the sake of time, we'll, we'll get going now. Um, so as I say, my name is, is Tim. I've um, my experience and, and my role in the company is really uh, from spending really the, about the past 17 years working in ophthalmology. I used to be uh, an ophthalmic photographer for the NHS for um, the best part of 10 years. And then I've been in the industry ever since uh, uh, leaving uh, the NHS. So um, I'm going to run through the first part of this uh, presentation with you. Um, I'm really going to introduce to you all. Um, the Iway Code. And the Iway Code is a new concept uh, we came up with in the Academy um, actually last year. And we've just run a very successful series of um, in person road shows before all this uh, lockdown uh, began. And we, we, we had uh, a run of, a, of five venues, I think we, we did the Iway Code uh, road show at, and it was really successful. So I'm going to. Um, and be able to share this um, this whole concept with you all this evening, walk you through exactly what the Iway code means and how you can use it to help you with your OCT interpretation. Then what's going to happen is I'm going to then cut to Mark Holloway. Mark is then going to uh, run through some of his own um, patients that he's he's seen and how OCT has helped him with the diagnosis and management of how he's driven his patients. But Mark is also going to use the Iway code technique to um, review the OCTs live for you this evening. And then at the end, um, hopefully we'll have some uh, a good portion of time left to be able to answer all of your questions. Again, just to remind you what's happening this evening in terms of your CT point. So um, these are our learning objectives for this session for um, um, an optometrist and, of course, a dispensing optometrist as well. Uh, and really, this is what the goal of this evening's session is, is trying to, to do for um, both of these disciplines. So for optometrists, um, hopefully it will help you um, learn a technique for how to assess OCT with your patients looking for signs of disease and um, really an understanding of how OCT can help us identify common causes of vision loss seen in practice um, and help you manage patients in the future. And for dispensing optometrists, again, it's looking at an understanding of how common eye diseases are seen in practice and appear on OCT and an understanding of the symptoms associated with these common retinal diseases uh, you might be able to see in practice. So again, you're going to um, accomplish these learning objectives through listening to a little bit of what I'm talking um, and really a good part of that will come from Mark's um, contribution to this session with his live patients, which will be really great. So I'm going to start by just walking you through exactly what the Iway code is. So the Iway code um, is really a, a system that we came up with um, to help any of uh, any of you that are, are primary care um, clinicians um, with a way to systematically interpret OCTs. That was our one of our goals with this process. And through creating and learning um, a systematic approach, it will obviously really help any of you who are um, trying to identify and diagnose or, or as, as good as you can understand what's happening on a patient's um, eye with when you scan it with an OCT. So again, by having a, a good system in place, that aids in the identification of, of understanding what we can see. And ultimately, the whole real point is, of course, to improve communication between eye care professionals. So what that means is, is just really refining and improving um, referrals rather than 
just sending any image to a, a, um, a secondary care system like an ophthalmologist or um, maybe an enhanced mech system just say I don't know what this is but it doesn't look good by using a system like the eyeway code it will just help you to refine how you describe that and really um, teach you a new language of describing things in OCT, which you might not know the exact diagnosis word for. That's the, really the whole point of the eyeway code. So I'll come to that in a moment and explain to you how that's going to work. But first of all, I just want to remind ourselves of, of exactly what optical coherence tomography is. Well, of course, OCT, as it's often abbreviated, is light, uh, a, a superluminescent diode of light that beams into the eye with OCT devices and reflects back from all different layers of the retina and sometimes when we see um, pathology as well. And that's how we get this wonderful in vivo cross section of the retina when we use this technology. And really, OCT has completely revolutionized ophthalmology and now optometry over the past 20 years really. Now the challenge with OCT has always been um, learning OCT. How do you become an expert? Now there's um, a famous book written by um, a chap called uh, Malcolm Gladwell that was published in 2008 and it was um, it was a book called Outliers and it was it coined a very famous and uh, now well-known concept that to become an expert in anything you need to spend 10,000 hours doing it now I, I think that's very true but I'm at the same time not suggesting that you won't be able to become an OCT expert unless you've spent uh, 10,000 hours and um, but again it's a it's a good metaphor to use because of course with OCT the crucial thing is is that you understand that you need to spend time looking at lots of them before you learn what's normal and what isn't. Now, one of the crucial parts of learning what's normal is learning all the different layers of the retina. Now, um, on your little menu bar for the GoToWebinar, you should notice that there's two handouts you can download. One of them is this image you can see on your screen here. And this is the... Um, uh, the Academy handout, this is a, a diagram we created using the um, 11 layer segmentation that our OCT system can do with the retina to really specify in different colors there, all the different layers of the, of the retina when you're using OCT. And it's absolutely crucial that anyone who's using this wonderful uh, technology really un it understands the anatomy of all the different layers. And the great thing about this, and um, this handout is it also comes with a cartoon that helps explain how the actual cells um, interact with each other through all those different colors and bands of uh, retinal layers. So as I, as I said, you can download that via the toolbar on the side. And you may also notice that there's an eyeway code handout, but I'll, I'll come to that um, in a moment when we uh, go through the eyeway code interpretation. So again, OCT is an incredibly valuable tool. But the tricky thing about OCT is understanding subtle things. Subtle can be difficult. And what do um, eye care practitioners do in a, in a primary care situation when they're faced with subtle variances with OCT? And really, this is where it comes, where the importance comes down to understanding the layers and ha having a language, a way you can explain these types of pathologies to um, a secondary care provider to help you with your referrals or even help you understand pathology that you've never seen before. You still need a way to be able to describe it. What you can see on the screen here is more flat, quiet retina, but again, um, there's some significant changes that make it different from a normal retina. Here we can see uh, geographic atrophy. So this waterfall or barcoding effect is very common when you have atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, like we see in dry AMD. Cases like this are very common now we see in primary care um, because so many asymptomatic people having OCTs these days. I mean, I've met lots and lots of optometrists over the years who find that lots of their patients have little uh, pigmented epithelial detachments and had no idea until they had an OCT. 
some of the sort of pathologies like this one here can actually be quite hard to see at first appearance. But when you look very closely, you can actually recognize that there's a bit of hyper reflective um, material at the center of this fovea on this eye. And that, of course, ties in with the solar burn. So what's actually happened there is this patient's eye, um, and this was actually a bilateral case, has just stared at the sun too long, which has uh, zapped that part of the central fovea. Uh, a very common um, condition, which is in the headlines a lot these days, is what you can see on the screen here. And again, this is a very uh, quiet appearance when it comes to OCT. You can see something on the infrared there, but when you actually look at all those different uh, layers of the retina, you can see that the outer nuclear layer is actually missing from this retina. And again, that's very common with hydroxychloroquine retinopathy or toxicity. So again, you wouldn't necessarily know all these straight away unless you'd looked at lots and lots of OCTs, but also you might not be able to, to be able to name and identify the actual condition. So that still happens in secondary eye care. We still have complicated cases where even ophthalmologists might not know the diagnosis straight away. So what does everyone do in those circumstances? Well, they use descriptive words to describe what the OCT is showing them. And these are 10 of those recognized terms. Some people use slight variations on these, but these are the, the widely uh, commonly used um, recognized terms. And what we wanted to do in the academy is, is come up with a way to help educate um, eye care practitioners, a way of memorizing these words um, when they're trying to describe OCTs. So you can see we have depression, elevation, fragmentation, interruption, irregularity, rupture, thick, um, thinning, thickening, and crucially, hyperreflectivity and hyporeflectivity. But we wanted to think of a way um, to help everyone recognize and remember those phrases when they're trying to describe pathology that they might not know the diagnosis name for. So I drive a lot with my job. Um, I, I, well, I used to uh, drive around seeing a lot of uh, customers and, and hospitals going and doing talks and things. And um, because I've been looking at OCTs for so many years, um, I I thought of this one day and we, we this was really what gave birth to the eye code is we had a, a chat about this in one of our academy meetings last year and I proposed the idea to everyone that when I look at this bumpy road sign when I'm driving around I don't actually see a bumpy road I see a macula now and um, because my brain is so OCT so with a bit of ingenious um, graphic design we managed to turn this bumpy road sign into a retina. And that was really what gave birth to um, creating hazard sign for each of those 10 descriptive warning signs. And really this is the crux of the eyeway code. It's a system we can use where we look at OCT images and apply these hazards to those images that we see with OCT. So what I'm going to do now is I want to do this with a healthy retina. So um, I'm just gonna to flick to that now. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this normal cross section of a healthy retina and we'll identify the things that um, may be surprised those of you that are new to OCT um, that are regular, normal, weird things. So we're gonna use the hazards to describe these, what we can see on this normal scan. But really what we're gonna do is and purposefully choose two of those hazards. Now, you may have heard the phrase B scan. B scan, of course, um, means uh, the brightness scan. So, what we're looking at with an OCT is actually the difference between light and dark. So, what we're going to do is we'll use the hyper and the hypo hazards. So, just look for some different um, pathology, well, different anatomies we can see on this normal retina. So, starting in the middle, you can see the little hot spot there in the right in the middle. That's very commonly known as the umbo reflection, which is absolutely normal. You can see across the surface, there's a bit of hyper reflection as well. So that's just the vitro retinal interface where you've got this very young, healthy eye and the uh, posterior hyaloid is sat um, flush against the inner limited membrane. And that again, creates a little bright hyper reflection. So that's not 
something to worry about, like an epiretinal main, membrane or something like that. It's just normal uh, anatomy that we see with OCT. This area in the middle is very commonly worried about by a lot of people new to OCT because it looks like a little lump that's hypo-reflective. But that, of course, is the cone photoreceptors right at the center of the fovea. So what we're doing is we're using all those eight other symbols to describe any um, uh, pathology or changes in the normal um, structure of the OCT with the IWAY code. So what I'm going to do, we're going to go through um, a hazard perception test, like some of you may have done when you did your driving test. Um, this is, of course, what we do uh, where you get a, a video of a car journey. You've got to click on the journey on the screen as you see hazards as they appear. And that was really the concept behind the highway code. We wanted a way to uh, teach people how to um, look for these hazards and identify them as they drive along. But before we could do that, we need a, a process in place before we start to look at hazards. Now, one of the crucial parts of that process is, of course, always checking the signal quality. Checking the signal quality should always be where you begin with OCT, because what you don't want to do is make any wrong assumptions about um, hazards that actually are only down to artifact. So checking the signal quality is crucial. And the way to do that is to really look at all those different layers of the retina when you're reviewing OCTs and make sure you can see them all before you uh, jump in and, and make any decisions. So as long as we've got good signal quality, we'll move on, go. The next part of the process is we come to checking the foveal profile. And crucially, the reason why we do this, um, particularly in medical retina, is we want to make sure that we've our scan is in the right place. Is it over the macula, the central part of the retina, which is essential for facial recognition and reading from a, uh, from a patient's eyesight? So are we actually scanning over the right area? And once we've established those two parts of the process, that's where we stop and we look for our hazards. So I'm now going to do that with a case. Um, so I'm just going to do this case before I then pass over to Mark and he's going to uh, do his live cases he's done with his patients uh, using the same process of the highway code. So here we have um, some pathology, okay, just like some of the scans I've showed you earlier. Um, so we've got some obvious changes on this retina that differentiate it from a normal scan haven't we but let's go through our highway code process so the first thing we want to check is do we have good signal quality well if i look at this b scan i can see all the contrast between all the different layers there from the top to the bottom of the scan i can even see um, different structures in the vitreous and actually i can even see down into the choroid on this b scan so that establishes and that we've got a very good um, uh, a very good signal quality. And also the fundus image, the infrared fundus image is actually telling us that as well. We've got a clear view of where this B scan is going over this circular uh, hypo-reflective blister on the surface of this retina. So let's go forwards and check the foveal profile. Well, I can see that's there as well. Actually, that's just been lifted up by this pathology we can see. And um, so what I could imagine with a patient like this is actually they might just have noticed a hyperopic shift in their eyesight. And the reason for that is simply because their photoreceptor layer has been elevated by this uh, pathology. But we're going to stop at this point and now use our eyeway code symbols to describe what we actually see in this B scan without even having the diagnosis. So let's go through why we think that's different. So the first thing we're seeing is elevation. Now, as I say, this first hazard is quite clearly proposing the idea that this is irregular, this elevated part of the photoreceptor layer. The second hazard we could see is hyperreflection. So we could see bright material there on that B scan that we don't see on a normal scan. But underneath that, we can also see hypo reflection so what's that telling us well in this part of the retina underneath the outer limiting membrane that is of course subretinal fluid so in a primary care setting that would almost be an instant referral because you've got a very unhealthy retina there with subretinal fluid and again that leaves the back door open for neovascularization before finally what have we got because we've got these three things happening 
we do indeed have thickening. And again, that coincides with our infrared image here where we've got a change in reflectivity simply because we have this blister of subretinal fluid right at the fovea. So by using the eyeway code without even you saying the um, the diagnosis in this case, we've got an extremely um, high quality description of the of the pathology that we can see here. So we could even refer that without saying what the diagnosis is. But this, of course, is a patient with central central serous chorioretinopathy, or abbreviated to CSCR. And a further um, sign that hazard sign that we can see that that's happening is with this enhanced depth image using our OCT, showing us that the choroid is also very thick. The choroid really should be about the same thickness of all the retina layers, and when it's double that, like it is here at the fovea, that's that's actually showing us that we've got a very thick um, stressed um, choroidal structure there, which is again very common with uh, central serous chorioretinopathy. So I hope that's given you a good idea of how the eyeway code process works. What I'm now going to do is pass you over to Mark, and Mark is going to run through uh, the rest of his uh, presentation. Good evening, all. I hope you can all uh, see and hear me. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, yeah, as Tim said at the beginning, at the outset, uh, my name is Mark Holloway. I'm an independent optometrist. Um, we've had a spectralis OCT since uh, June, July 2014. Uh, so coming up six years, um, I probably haven't quite spent 10,000 hours on it. So just calculating that through, that works out about six and a half hours per working day. But, um, you know, I've done a few thousand, a few thousand hours at least on it. Um, however, I'm by no means an expert. What I'm going to try and take you through is is nine patients. We're going to get. I'm going to try and give you a brief history, um, a little bit of background on the patient, and then we'll look at some OCT images. I'll talk you through uh, sort of interpretation using the eyeway code uh, that Tim's uh, sort of fairly comprehensively taking you through there, and then we'll go through what I did with the patient. Now. It's not necessarily to say that that's 100% correct. Um, I'm only going through my differential diagnosis. Some of these uh, cases go back a few years and I was um, not as far down my OCT journey as I am now, but it's what I did. Um, we're all human and, and we, all, we all have to learn. Um, as Tim said, please do submit questions during, during the, um, the time that I'm talking is something crops up and then uh, Emily uh, will will sort of collate those and feed those back to Tim and I and we'll try and cover as many as we can uh, possibly at the end. So use your little question mark uh, logos to uh, to ask us some uh, some interesting questions. So um, first patient I'm going to talk you through is uh, so scenario one, if you like, female, 70 years old. It's an early sight test presenting symptom. Something's wrong with the central vision in my left eye. It's like a circular yellow patch. I can see through it, but it's not clear. Uh, sure enough, the vision 612 minus previously at the previous sight test had been more similar to the right eye, sort of 66 plus minus. On the pressures and things are fine. Volk, slightly fuzzy, fo slightly fuzzy fovea, uh, central macular region. Um, when we look at the OCT, this is the image that we get. Now, before we dive in with um, sort of a diagnosis, I do would like to reiterate what Tim said. It's really, really important to use a systematic approach when you're looking at these images, because there's a temptation when we're doing this to go, oh, it's a this, oh, it's a the other. But, you know, you can get co-pathologies. You can get more than one thing going on at once. So let, let, let's try and let's try and talk through this one. So using the eyeway code, what have we got here? Well, we've got areas of hypo reflectivity. There's a fairly large area of hyper reflectivity just here, which is definitely not uh, what we, something we would expect to see in this part. Well, it, or indeed any part of the retina. We've got elevation. That uh, seam of hypo reflectivity fluid is causing the retina to um, to, to sort of bow and, and, and have that sort of, uh, you know, convex appearance. And we've also got areas of hyper reflectivity. Some bits just down here are, are, aren't quite right. Now, the obvious thing to do is to look at the large hypo reflective area just here and, and jump in with the diagnosis of, oh, it's a CSR uh, or a CSCR, a central serous retinopathy. Now, 
I saw that, but because I'm trying to use a, a systematic approach, I know what I was fairly confident what this was. The bit that bothered me more was this little area here. And this is the area where you can see some scattering of hyper reflectivity and hypo reflectivity. And my concern was that that was potentially an early CNV, an early choroidal near vascularization that was then subsequently causing the CSR or the fluid underneath the retina. Now, I ended up sending this to um, to uh, Chesterfield Royal, which is the local hospital to us. They took a look at the image and then rescanned the patient and, and they were like, mm, we, we see what you mean. Um, so they ended up doing fluorescein angiography. Now, thankfully for the patient, um, it was confirmed that it wasn't a, um, a wet AMD, it wasn't a CNV. It was, pro it was probably just, when you look at the infrared image on the surface here, you can see again the areas of hyperreflectivity there. So there's possibly a small patch of drusen or something there. Um, so maybe, maybe a tiny patch of dry, dry macular degeneration but the main problem was the CSR. She is now being monitored by the hospital and as tends unfortunately to be the case, she's kind of been lost to me for a spell until she comes back and she's, she's been discharged and, and things are stable and she's able to, able to pick up again with a routine eye care. But really important not to jump in with your first diagnosis and go for the obvious. Make sure you take a systematic approach to looking at the, at the whole image um, that you have in front of you. Patient two, uh, male, 52 years old, routine sight test, uh, 6.5 right and left, ophthalmoscopy, no real abnormalities right and left. So patient one, very obvious, sort of probably a fairly acute onset central serous retinopathy. When we look at this one, this is um, the same eye, this, um, but obviously separated by time. So the top image there was taken July 2019. The bottom image taken December 2019. Now, this patient um, has, particularly in the top image, we've got areas again of elevation in this area just here, similar to the prior um, Case, stu case study patient and also an area of um, hypo reflectivity just underneath here. Now, this patient is um, decided that he wanted to be referred for uh, ophthalmological second opinion. He's in a private health scheme. He can claim back. He wants to be referred privately just to just to get this, sec this checked out. Um, so I sent him to a colleague of mine in Sheffield and it was confirmed that it was um, sort of a, 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 a can you call it central serous retinopathy when it's not really bang central? But either way, it's a serous retinopathy. Now, this gentleman has a, a fairly high profile IT job, fairly stressed, bit of a type A personality. Um, and so whilst it was confirmed back that it was a central serous retinopathy, the other thing that the ophthalmologist did was write a letter, was gave the patient a letter to give to his HR um department at work seeing if there was anything that could be done about his sort of work-life balance level of stress hours worked easy things to write letters about very difficult things to change particularly um if you're just that way inclined as a personality type but this gentleman's now coming back to see me on a three monthly basis on the recommendation of the ophthalmologist um we know that if it doesn't encroach if it doesn't get really any bigger or any deeper and he's asymptomatic and there's no impact on his visual acuities then we're just going to monitor this. And what basically happens is, is this thing just waxes and wanes. And each time he comes, we can uh, we can keep a check on that. And the spectralis is excellent for that because it locks onto the retinal fingerprint and it allows you to rescan exactly the same time. So we can convert, we're only looking at one B scan line here, but there are uh, 56 line scans that make up that. There are 56 line scans that happen through this box and you can set them to run as a movie. So we can just set this up to run as a movie, compare the two against each other, take a few measurements. Is it getting any wider in this direction or is it getting any deeper in this direction versus the worst that it's been? Are you symptomatic? Are your VAs OK? If all that's OK, um, we, we just review and set up an appointment for another three months. And he really values that because it means that we're going to pick things up, hopefully fairly uh fairly uh, fairly quickly for him. Moving on to patient three, uh, female, 50 years old, routine sight test, six, five right and left, ophthalmol ophthalmoscopy, if I can say it, uh, no abnormalities right and left, um, happy days, all's looking good. And 
then we do the OCT and we get an appearance like this. So again, let's be systematic. What have we got going on here? Obviously, if you're taking a cross section right through the foveal center, we should have a fairly uniform dip that would take that sort of shape. So what we've got here is an area of slight elevation. We've got an area of high po reflectivity just here, this dark um, sort of cyst, if you like, or dark space. And I possibly could have had hyper reflectivity because there's this line here, which as many of you I'm sure will be comfortable with, is actually the posterior hyaloid face. So what's happening here is that the um, the patient, there is some subtle adhesion between the posterior vitreous face and, and the fovea, which is causing some traction. Um, and it's causing that central foveal pit to just be pulled up ever so slightly. And that's what we would call vitreomacular traction. Now, in these scenarios, I always tend to discuss these with the patient and explain what my thought process is. So in this case, it would go something like, you're six five, you're asymptomatic. Had we not have got OCT, we wouldn't have even possibly even known this was here. But now we have got OCT with a decision to make, and that is, do we monitor it ourselves or do we refer you? Now, in terms of referral, um, you could refer if the patient wanted to and particularly wanted that, but that, that's kind of their call. Um, in this case, I actively try to not refer. The patient's asymptomatic, the VAs are, are, are very, very good. And the other question to ask yourself is, what are the hospital going to do? They can use ocroplasmin to try to um, cleave the bond between the posterior vitreous face and the, and, and, and the macula, the fovea, but that's fast becoming a dirty word as far as I'm aware with the ophthalmologist that I speak to on occasion. Your other option to treat this is a vitrectomy, which is pretty big surgery to do what? Make 6-5 vision any better? You know, the, the risk is far higher than the potential reward. So with, with, with the patient, we've agreed that what we're going to do with this is we're just going to monitor it. She's obviously been given advice. Uh, cover up the uh, the fellow eye. If you notice that the right eye deteriorates, you get a sudden change in vision, make contact with me, come in straight away. And we're reviewing this. Um, I think she's on a three, four month uh, re recall. Uh, just basically, excuse the pun, to keep an eye on it. Um, and again, these two images are separated between uh, December. Uh, I must have done it sooner than that. 16th of December and 13th of January. So we've done a fairly quick recall. Um, over a month just to make sure there's, there's no significant changes. Um, so yeah, again, a happy patient, record everything that you've discussed with the patient, record the fact that you've made a joint uh, decision and any, the patient's been allowed to make an informed decision on, on patient care and the next steps and move on, book a review appointment. Just as an aside, in my local area, vitreo macular traction and things like that, they're probably not going to be wanting to look at these until you're 6, 9, 6, 12, or the patient's symptomatic, or if it's really hanging on by a thread and you think there's a serious risk of, of, of it causing a macular hole. Um, but um, they tend to be rare, even some ones where the, the, the cystics, the, the, the sort of the tiny space as it's pulling and, and, and separating that retina, even the ones that get quite big tend to pop off and then and then sink back down. So uh, which is obviously great for the patient. Patient four, female, 87 years old, routine, asymptomatic, or at least asymptomatic in terms of change. VAs are stable, but obviously not great. 624 minus in the right, count fingers in the left. There's extensive uh, hard and soft drusen in both eyes. Now, this is a long-standing patient. She's had poor vision for a long time. And these are the images. So these images are from July 2019 and January 2020. Um, and what you can see here is, um, again, using our eyeway code, we've got areas of irregularity. The lower levels of the retina uh, um, are very sort of irregular. We've got fragmentation that you can see through the, the sort of the barcoding um, where the signal transmission is higher, where there's more um, atrophy. We've got areas of hyper reflectivity, both on the infrared images. You can see that these things here are probably hard drusen and um, and also on here where you've got the drusen appear hyper reflective. 
So this this is this is a fairly classic um, case of dry macular degeneration. Now this lady is not having these OCT scans because she feels that it's going to change her vision or improve her vision. The reason that she's doing it, and she always attends with the daughter, is because she's quite a nervous patient. She lives on a uh, she thinks she lives on her own. She's very limited vision, and she wants the reassurance, and she really, really values the peace of mind that these images and that the backs of her eyes aren't changing, both that the visual acuity is stable and that um, the clinical appearance at the back of her eyes is, is pretty stable as well. Um, and she always walks in very timidly with her head down, and she's always expecting the worst. Thankfully, touch wood to press, I've always been able to give her as good news as you can in these situations that things are looking pretty stable um you know it hasn't changed in the last six months 12 months 18 months on a rolling six month basis you know just um report any change uh but other than that continue to to do what you're doing that there's you know with the lifestyle advice and things like that that we give but she greatly appreciates coming and doing this on a six monthly basis as, as does her daughter um, dry macular degeneration is one of those things that's incredibly common and anybody with an OCT is going to see a lot of it. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things that we need to get fairly comfortable at looking at. Patient five, moving on. Um, male, 74 years old, routine, no significant change, right eye, 6'9". Now, this patient's a long-standing patient, but has also had a history of wet, wet macular degeneration, wet AMD for quite a while. They're seen at the hospital roughly every six weeks. And to date, when I took these images or this image, they'd had uh, 13 injections. Now, this wasn't really showing us anything particularly new, but I thought this was a good case study, uh, obviously with patient consent to show you these, to show you a, a fairly classic uh, case uh, of, of, of wet AMD. But sorry, I'm jumping the gun. Let's use our eyeway code. So what have we got here? We've got some irregularity. We've got irregularity here. We've got irregularity here on the surface. You know, it, it does not look like a happy retina. We've got areas of hyperreflectivity. We've got areas of elevation, again, in the central area. And we've got areas of hyporeflectivity, both here, but probably of more concern is this area just here. Now, this is a pretty uh, classic, um, picture and case of um, of wet AMD with a classic irregular raised drusenoid uh, epithelial detachment along the bottom here, so epithelial detachment across the bottom here with overlaying uh, or overlying uh, subretinal fluid, which is the hyporeflective area that I'm just pointing out with my, with my cursor just here. Um, and again, in a similar one to the CSR, depending on the point that I scan, this patient waxes and wanes a little bit. The reason that this patient wants me to continue doing these scans, even though they're doing them at the hospital, is the fact that he's allowed to see them and I have the time and make the time to talk him through them. The problem with the hospital eye departments, they're incredibly busy, they do an incredible job, but they're doing these scans for their decision-making process <clears throat> and not for the patient's peace of mind. So I have quite a lot of patients who go to the hospital and then come to see me to and pay me to duplicate tests purely so that I can help talk them through and, and, and they can understand their condition and, um, you know, the progression or lack of progression thereof. So they, re they really value this. Moving on to patient six, we've now got a male, 68 years old. This was a new patient on present the first time he saw me, but this is back to 2014, the first time I saw him. He's now a, a, a diehard a fan patient, if you like. Um, his last eye exam previous to this was two years. Vision's pretty good, 6'6 six, six right, 6'75 six, plus left. Ophthalmoscopy showed um, early lens changes. Drusen, sort of macular, mottling, pigmentary change, that kind of non-specific appearance that you get um, in what you think is going to be dry macular change. Amsler, again, he reported no, no distortion, no metamorphopsia on Amsler. But given it's the first time I'd seen him, we've got the technology available. I discussed the, the advantages of OCT for managing and monitoring him going forward. And we thought we were just going to be taking a baseline, a baseline image. And this is what we got. Top image is the right eye, bottom image, bottom right image is the left eye. And using again the eyeway code, what we can see in these is areas of hyperreflectivity on both the infrared images and also underneath where we've got these, this, this, these drusen. We've got elevation within both retinas. 
We've got areas again of irregularity in both retinas, and we've got areas of hypo reflectivity in both retinas. Now, despite the fact that the patient 66 plus or 66 plus minus, if you like, in both eyes with asymptomatic, I was concerned with with the fluid and um, sorry, with the hypo reflective areas. And so I called up Chesterfield Royal, sent them over the images, and they agreed it didn't look quite right. And it was confirmed that he'd got uh, wet macular degeneration in both eyes. So bilateral, basically same time onset, bilateral wet macular degeneration. Uh, it was a bit of a strange one, this, because by the time he made it to the hospital, the visual acuity in the right eye, I think, had decreased, which meant that his right eye qualified for Lucentis injections under the NHS. With the left eye, however, the, vi the visual acuity had held up fairly well and there hadn't been the same progression. So at one stage, he was getting somebody to drive him to Chesterfield Royal for his right eye to be injected with Lucentis on the NHS, jump him back in the car and go into um, a private hospital in Sheffield to have the left eye injected with a Vastin privately, um, again, by uh, by the same um, ophthalm ophthalm ophthalmologist colleague over in Sheffield. Um, I've never since seen or really spoken to many people about um about them having asymptomatic wet amd patients generally speaking they tend to be symptomatic and it tends to be unilateral at least at first presentation um so it's really again it just ha really hammers home the fact that you really need to look at these images in pretty pretty good detail um if you're going to pick up the fine points because you know that could be the difference between potentially saving somebody's sight now as i said this gentleman is now a, a, a you know a fairly long-standing patient he's coming to see me uh, on a 12 monthly basis again he's having the scans done every time he comes we look at them and he's actually been discharged now he responded very very well to the three loading phase um that he ended up having in both eyes uh, his vision somewhere set, has settled at six six minus right and left he's a little bit photophobic which you tend to find in patients with macular disturbance problems um but he has uh, transitions lenses and um you know is doing incredibly well still driving he's retired but still driving and doing everything he wants to do with his life which is which is obviously fantastic and i'm not sure i could say could guarantee that that would have been the case had we not have done these scans moving on to patients seven and eight i've grouped these two patients together because um the sort of similar but different um so patient seven is a male 62 years old a little bit of central blur six nine plus minus he's had recently had cataract surgery patient eight is a male 77 years slight decrease in vision near vision more so than distance can be a little bit variable and the patient is diabetic control recently has been slightly variable by his own admission so looking at the uh, looking at the OCTs, patient uh, seven is at the top, patient eight is at the bottom. What have we got? Well, again, we've got irregularity, particularly on this lower image. This patient's the older gentleman, uh, so we've got some irregularity down here. We've got some hyperreflective areas again, both on the infrared, but more so on the B scan, and we've got areas of of, of elevation to the to the retina just just here, and overall elevation on this one and also areas of hypo reflectivity. Now, this is um, macular edema, but two different types of macular edema. The top one is uh, pseudophagic cystoid macular edema, and the bottom one is uh, diabetic macular edema due to uh, sort of, if you like, poor control or loss of control. Now, again, one of the points that I perhaps should have elaborated and stressed earlier on a little bit more is that the OC, whilst the OCT is an absolutely incredible bit of kit, and I would really hate to be without mine now, um, it isn't a magic box that has the answer to everything. And if you were just given those two images, um, you know, it can be very difficult to determine the diabetic macular edemas from the cystoid macular edemas or indeed the cause of the macular edema. So in this case, a, th a thorough and full history and symptoms elucidates the fact that the top one is, is pseudophagic because he's recently had or we can be fairly certain it's pseudophagic because of the recent surgery. The bottom one, because of the recent lack, loss of control, um, we can be fairly certain that that's a, you know, a diabetic one. Now, in both of these cases, 
Um, the, again, the management and treatment of these patients was slightly different. The top, gen uh, the top gentleman was treated with um, steroids to reduce the inflammation. The bottom one, and I've seen the top guy since, and everything's fine. The retina has sunk back down, retinal thickness mapping, um, no evidence of hyporeflective spaces. It's just gone completely back to normal. The bottom gentleman, the last time I spoke to him, was not having any treatment for this other than intervention through better control of diet and things like that. So, um, you know, we, um, you know, history and symptoms do, do, do shed a lot of light on what might need to happen with the management, both by ourselves in, in primary care settings, but also in secondary care settings, be that GPs, ophthalmologists, etc. But again, pretty common um, presentations, um, both of these. We see them fairly regularly. Right, we're in the home stretch, guys, so don't panic. Um, patient nine. Uh, somebody I know very well. This happens to be my father-in-law. So um, <clears throat> he's a male, 76 years old, routine sight test, but, you know, on asking and on a bit more grilling, slight decrease in the uh, in the vision, more so right eye than left eye, early lens changes. So we look at the OCT. What have we got? We've got areas of irregularity, both on the surface of the retina, but also in this area in the lower level of the retina. We've got hyperreflectivity, uh, hyperreflective areas um, down in the lower level of the retina here, but also this sort of like line that sits on the top of the retina just here. We've got elevation. This is a, it's not quite probably through the fovea, but you can see that it's not far off due to the uh, due to the photoreceptor coning up like this as it as it's pulled up and some areas of hyporeflectivity in, in this area just here. Now, I said in the um, in the uh, in the outset that there's some early lens changes here. Now, I've chosen to only show one image here, but this um, my father-in-law does have some early lens change. He also has a long-standing epiretinal membrane, and that's what this is here. It's a long-standing epiretinal membrane. Uh, along the top of there, which is causing the, the sort of the surface of the retina to kind of pucker up, pull up the, the, the central foveal profile, which is probably a contributor to visual acuity. But um, given that this image looks exactly the same as the last one, I think probably the visual acuity decline is more likely lenticular than, than retinal. And that, again, you know, the OCT doesn't have to diagnose the problem. The OCT, OCT can allow you to um, disregard certain problems and pull other things from slit lamp assessments or whatever more into play. And that's what's going on here. So he's got some lenticular change. You can see that there's slightly more noise in this image. Um, so whilst it's acceptable and I can see all the layers that I need to see, the image isn't quite as clean and sharp as some of the other images I've shown you. We've got the ep classic epiretinal membrane appearance across the top. And we've also got this sawtooth appearance here, which is consistent with where these this dark sort of like leopard print patches here. And this is uh, this is some reticular drusen, which again is is a relatively common uh, finding on OCT in um, in our older patient base. So again, management. What are we doing with this gentleman? Well, nothing. His epiretinal membrane is exactly the same. His visual acuity is at six nine plus means that he's not really quite qualifying for cataract surgery and he's not mad keen to have it. Um, the macular degeneration is dry, so it is managed through advice and, 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 uh, and monitoring. So it's, this is a, one of those cases of review, um, review in probably three to six months, um, depending, on, uh, depending on your agreement with the patient. But again, great tool to be able to have because it allows you to be more certain which of the factors is is causing the visual the vision decline in this particular case where it's a bit of a multifactorial situation. Right, I'm just going to kind of last slide before we uh, get into questions. So, what would be my main takeaway points from my bit? First of all, get confident with normal anatomy. As Tim said at the outset, if you don't know what normal anatomy looks like, it's very, very difficult to know what problems look like. And so I would urge you to download the retinal layers handout that is attached to the presentation. In terms of um, medical retina, so central retinal pathologies, which is what we're covering today, these conditions obviously don't cover your glaucomas or your um, anterior segment type problems, but uh, be comfortable with macula. 
issues, dry and wet AMD, particularly if you have a fairly elderly patient base, but also the teleform changes, incredibly common, incredibly common. Epiretinal membranes, vitreum macular tractions, posterior epithelial detachments. I haven't showed you one of these, one of those, but Tim showed you one in his section. Uh, CSR or CSCR, central serous chorioretinopathy, and then your macular edema, cystoid macular edema, diabetic macular edema. I would say my gut feel is that those conditions on that slide will probably account for 80% plus 90% of your um, abnormal presentations. And as Tim said, we're not expected to know absolutely everything. So for those that you aren't comfortable with making a, a diagnosis or even a differential diagnosis in this day and age, print and uh, send with a covering letter with your explanation using iway code terminology and send that in or better still nhs.net email address get some pdfs off the off your oct and again send send that we're not expected to know everything okay and also last point on the bottom of that slide don't forget a good history and symptoms or your slit lamp everything else are just toys that surround the, the, the sort of the mainstay of an assessment which is which starts with a good history and symptoms okay Thank you very much for listening. Um, as we've said already, don't forget to submit your questions. And I think Emily's now going to bring back in Tim and we'll go through some questions. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, absolutely brilliant once again. Um, and as as Mark really well put in his in his cases there, you can see how the process of the highway code can really help um, in cases when you don't have that diagnosis. And as you can hear, Mark has got years and years of experience and he's, he's, absolute, he's an absolutely excellent um, optometrist with his OCT. But those of you that maybe uh, don't know that diagnosis straight away, the whole point of this session, as we keep trying to say, is, is just remember that, um, you know, the, the highway code is a process that we want to teach you so that you can, um, that you can you can really describe a pathology without the actual uh, diagnosis name so that's the idea behind it so here's emily hi emily and um, we're going to go through some of our questions now now as mark was talking and um, myself and emily have tried to answer um as many of your questions as we could in the time so emily have you got some um questions you thought we should answer between me and mark yeah, sure. I've made a note of some of the questions um, that have come through. Um, so one of the questions, um, this is for Mark. Um, do you have any advice regarding who you recommend OCT to in practice and how would you charge for it? And what do you charge? OK, so um, I would tend to recommend OCT to most people, if not everybody. Um, one reason for that is purely to put down a baseline, a marker in the sand. This is what your eyes look like at 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, where hopefully your vision's good, you've got no pathologies. Now, and that can sit there. And then if you don't need to use it for five or 10 years, it doesn't matter. We don't tend to get massive uptake in, in you know, the teenage 20, 30 year olds. We do get some. Where people start to do it more is, is where we get into the sort of 40, 50s and 60s, where People are getting a bit more concerned about their own health and, and managing that health. Maybe they've got the income to be able to pay a little bit for it. We'd be more, we'd be more, um, I'd be a bit more pushy, if that's the right word, in patients where there's known family histories or I'm seeing something through another assessment. So family histories of glaucoma, family histories of macular degeneration, um, you know, or I've seen something myself. There's a slightly dodgy visual field, but it's not desperate. Um, you know, IOP may be slightly different, whatever it may be, it just helps to build up the picture. So everybody, but we're more forceful with some groups um, and cost is £35 currently. <laughs> Yeah, and I'd, I'd, I'd really just to add to what Mark's saying there, on, on my travels over the years, going and see lots of different optometrists up and down the country, independents um, mainly, um, that seems to be the kind of national average price is around sort of 30, 35 pounds. And it's been that way for quite a few years, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, pre-COVID, pre, pre, pre -COVID, we were looking at pushing to 39 because you're right, we've been 35 
for a long time. Mm. Um, I know people that charge an awful lot more for OCT, but I think you've got to be realistic with the demographic of where your practice is located. And I took the view that I'd rather charge slightly less and let more people enjoy and get the benefit from it than make it a 100, 150, 200 pound um, sort of um, I wouldn't say extravagance, but something that in my demographic may put it beyond some people's reach. But, you know, I've got colleagues that do all sorts of different things and there's no right or wrong. It's just what you believe is right for you and your business. Great. Thanks, Mark. And um, we've got another question here, a common one that we get. Um, we're worried about over referring and angering the local ophthalmologists. So mm -hmm. is there something that helps you decide whether to refer urgently versus emergency, for example, and um, how do you make those decisions? Where did you start? Me, um, I, I tend to take the view of discussing it with the patient and base it on, you know, if, if there's an acute symptom presentation, then I, I would I would refer. Um, Obviously, there are some things that you have to refer according to college guidelines. So if you see wet AMD, you're not going to sit on that and look at it again in another couple of weeks. Um, so some of it depends on local protocols. Some of it depends on, um, you know, the hospital, what the hospitals want to see in your area. So get comfortable with that. Some of it is dependent upon your own personal um sort of like knowledge and uh, and how happy you are with with the with the differential diagnosis that you've made i think when i first got my oct my you know when i first qualified i was referring lots and then the referrals dropped down and then you get an oct and then they spike up again and now i would say that my my referrals are, are, are below the level probably at the lowest level that they've ever been and when i am making a referral i'm making it backed up with evidence either there's something acutely happened or there's a progressive change happening that needs to be looked at say in the case of glaucomas or or, 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 or other conditions um that you need a second opinion on but the, the overriding thing is agree with the patient and record that you know whatever decision you make make sure that the patient is happy with that and that they're aware that they've got the option to change their mind if they want to great thanks and um, perhaps one for um, Tim here um, initially. So when describing, um, for example, uh, irregularity to so one of these terminologies, would you say it's important to say where in the retina um, you noticed that? Um, is it important to mention the exact retinal layer? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think I can probably answer two questions with my answer, actually, Em. Um, you're absolutely right. And this is why, as I said at the, my introduction there, it's absolutely imperative that anyone who's regularly using OCT um, almost knows the layers off the back of the hand, really. And that's that's why we focus so much in, with our education and, and with the handouts and things. Um, it's absolutely essential that you always use the layer when you're thinking of the uh, the warning or the hazard sign you're seeing. Um, now, the other question I think I could probably answer with that is someone also asked me to repeat what I said about hydroxychloroquine to toxicity. And a very common finding with this condition, um, which is still um, needs fully proving with a big giant research study. But we, what we can certainly notice with that condition in itself is actually loss of the outer nuclear layer. Um, but you definitely also see that with retinitis pigmentosa as well. So that's that's when you lose a whole actual layer of the retina. Um, and I've, I've even seen that on some patients who report um, cases of night blindness, uh, very thin outer nuclear layers uh, as well. So yeah, in answer to that main question, Emily, yeah, it's, it's knowing the layers is absolutely essential with OCT. Great, thanks. And um, another couple of questions, um, perhaps uh, this is from Mark that, um, is there a sort of a standard scan protocol you use on all patients with the OCT? Um, so what other sort of scans do you use um, sort of most of all? So if somebody books a sort of routine OCT appointment where we may be setting up a baseline, I would do uh, sort of three scans as standard. I would do a high resolution vertical horizontal cross section right through the foveal pit, right through the, 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 the fovea. Um, so that's number one. The the spectralis also has a 61 line scan um central um retinal um volume scan uh which is great for many things it gives you a good view of 61 lines of the retina on a b scan 
But you can also segment those B scans and build up volume maps, thickness maps, things like that, which can give you changes in glaucoma in thickness profile, which can be uh, interesting for medical retina cases, but also for glaucoma. So that's two. And the third scan is moving over to the optic nerve head and taking an RNFL scan around the, the optic nerve head for glaucoma reasons, really, and change reasons. And obviously, if during the scan I see something that looks a bit out of the ordinary or a bit different, then I can go in and do ad hoc additional scans. But as a general suite of scans, if somebody ever came to my practice, they'd see that all of my patients have got a vertical horizontal cross section, a volume map, 61 through the central, large central retina, and then an RNFL plot. And um, another question here, uh, when you do recalls on the NHS mark, so uh, recalls on NHS patients uh, to monitor OCTs, um, are they private or um, are, are they NHS? So when you do those recalls, are they private patients, are they NHS patients, where are they coming from? Um, sorry, um, most of my patients, probably uh, 65, 70 percent of my patients are NHS by the virtue of age not by the virtue of um voucher sort of um being allowed a voucher so they are nhs patients but what i'll often do is is keep them on say i'm just monitoring something i'll agree with the patient we can have them on a two-year nhs recall as standard but we can stick an OCT in at 12 months or even at 6, 12 and 18 months should we want to do, because you don't necessarily always need the full sight test, in my opinion, if you're just trying to monitor something. So I'm not sure if I've answered your question there, but I don't always do an NHS funded sight test and a scan. Often I'll, I'll do the NHS funded sight test in as per the guidelines for the provision of an NHS sight test. And if they need interim scans, then we can book those and they yeah, they pay for those privately. Okay. And then when you and a patient decide to monitor a condition, uh, do you inform the GP and update them after each subsequent follow up check every time? Um, might well get shut down for this, but no, um, because until there's something to report, I would take the the approach that I'm looking after the patient. Um, I mean, they changed the rules with regards to diabetes uh, a couple of three years ago now. So unless you see something that's a change or notable change, you don't inform the, the GP. Uh, you used to have to inform the GP every time you saw somebody with diabetes. And it, it's just a bureaucratic, in my opinion, nightmare because 95, 98 percent of your letters are just I've seen a diabetic patient. They're fine. Um, it's worked for me. It's worked for the GP. It, it's kind of unnecessary. I think there needs to be enough trust that you'll report change or significant problems and findings. Um, if a patient asked me to report to the GP or if the GP had asked me to assess the patient because they were getting headaches or they were complaining of, of something and the GP had asked me, then, of course, I would report back to the GP. But I don't report to the GP every time I see a patient, no. And uh, maybe this was just one for Tim. Um, what does barcode mean on the OCT? I know that was something you mentioned in your presentation. Sorry, yeah, um, yeah. Barcode um, is very much like uh, an eyeway codism, really. It's uh, just a word that um, a lot of ophthalmologists use to explain the appearance when OCT light falls through the RPE. And that generally happens when you have an area of atrophy of the RPE um, and it will look like columns or barcodes of light simply because on that B scan you're going through, you're probably cutting through several uh, shapes or holes along that single line. And when you just look at that single B scan, those columns of light resemble a barcode. Uh, a, a, a word that's often used in, in, in the same sense is also the word, the term waterfall. Um, again, I've heard a lot of ophthalmologists use that phrase or a waterfall appearance where we have this area of geographic atrophy. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So um, unfortunately, I don't think we can answer all the questions that have come through. Uh, we always get lots and lots of questions and we'd be here all night and we're aware of the time and it's getting a little bit late and the sun's going down behind me. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to 
thank our guest speaker, Mark Holloway, and um, my colleague, Tim Cole, for their presentations. Um, you will get a handout um, of the IWA code and the retinal layers um, in an email just after this webinar. Um, so if you haven't been able to download them on the handouts tab, don't worry, they're coming. Um, and a recording of this webinar will be available um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, so if you want to sign up to our newsletter um, to be keep informed of that, and there'll be a link uh, sent in the email after this webinar about that as well. So thank you very much for joining us and um, have a nice evening. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Thank you very much, everyone.